Hello, everyone. Welcome to. Bienvenue à notre quatrième session de la. Today we are talking about FAQs. So we're having an FAQ roundtable with this large and impressive list of co-panelists today. I'll introduce everyone very briefly. We have Dr. Freddy Ariza Cadena with the University Universidad del Valle, Colombia. Dr. Balavanke Subramanian, Ganga Medical Center and Hospitals, India. Dr. Fadzai Mugadza, University of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. Dr. Anna Maria Crawford, Stanford University. Dr. Mark Singleton, Stanford University. Dr. RJ Ramamurthy, Stanford University. Dr. Mike Lipnick, University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Andrea Murray, Stanford University. Dr. Elizabeth Nua Nuasor, Ahmadu Bello University Teaching Hospital, Nigeria, and Dr. Vanessa Moll, University of Zurich, Switzerland. Thank you, all of our panelists, for joining today. I'm just briefly going to run through our etiquette, our Project Echo etiquette and housekeeping. Our programming is based on a foundation of love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react if you disagree with something. Today, we will be using the chat function for Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please send all questions through the chat box and feel free to introduce yourself. Please turn on your video if your internet allows for that and position your webcam effectively to show your face if alone or to capture the whole group. If you have any IT issues, please send a message through the, ch the chat to echo IT or email the address below. So you know the session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. And please be mindful of infection prevention and control. Try to limit the number of people joining from one gathering place and practice physical distancing. One quick note about in interpretation. We do have live interpretation today in French and Spanish. If you'd like to join either of those rooms, please click on the interpretation button on the bottom right of your screen. You can choose either the French or Spanish button, and then you'll be sent over to that uh, line and you can listen to the translation, which will be louder than the speaker. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Anna Crawford to get us started. Good morning. I'm Anna Crawford. I'm the program director um, of global health equity at Stanford University and also the editor of the Global Anesthesia and Critical Care Learning Resource Center. So I'm going to show uh, my screen now and share it with you so that we can go through the Learning Resource Center, which is um, how we often host our resources and materials for the Oxygen and Critical Care webinar series. So just wanna do a quick introduction of the Learning Resource Center for you. Actually, Mike, do you mind sharing your resources? I'm having a technical issue really quickly. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Lipnick, who also has some very important resources that are available to you for oxygen and critical care. No problem. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Lipnick, anesthesia and critical care at UCSF. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can share a few resources with you as we get started here. Um, Anna, can you see my screen okay? Great. Um, so the project that uh, I'm going to be telling you about very briefly over the next couple of minutes is called Open Critical Care. Uh, the web address is opencriticalcare.org and you can access the site using the QR codes. This is a project that is uh, supported by USAID, Star in the Public Health Institute, in collaboration with the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists and several other partners. We're excited to be here today working with Assist International, Stanford, and Anna and the LRC. 
Um, open critical care was set up uh, during the COVID pandemic to try and create a portal for open access, high quality critical care teaching resources. Um, the focus has been oxygen ecosystem related supply delivery, et cetera. Um, although ultimately we intend to have the focus of the, this portal uh, be much broader. Um, on the homepage, uh, there are a few resources I wanted to highlight in particular uh, through a partnership with Ariadne Labs. Um, Ariadne Labs and the Better Evidence Group there has been working directly with UpToDate to provide free subscriptions to UpToDate, which is a, a fantastic clinical decision-making tool. Um, I would encourage everybody to please click on that link and see if you're eligible for a free subscription. If you have any issues, please do reach out. It's a wonderful resource. It can be accessed again from the homepage by using this QR code, and I'll put the link in after um, this talk. Another feature on the website that I wanted to highlight was a frequently asked questions page about oxygen with many questions and answers related to what we'll be talking about today. Here's a picture of the frequently asked questions page. Again, you can access it with the QR code. You can search by keyword or navigate directly to certain topics. For example, this is a question about what different ventilator circuit types exist. Um, these can all be shared easily by clicking on the link. If you can't find what you're looking for, we also will respond to questions directly submitted through the web portal. Along those same lines, we offer through the website live chat once a week with experts from our team. And when the chat is live, the button at the top right of the homepage will change to green and you'll be directly connected with somebody on our team in real time. We have a resource library that includes some of the resources from uh, the Stanford team and ASSIST, uh, as well as many others from around the web um, and continues to be added to on a daily basis. Here are a couple of the types of resources you might find. For example, this course on mechanical ventilation, which we've been partnering with the American Association of Respiratory Care and Harvard edX to translate into Spanish. Uh, this oxygen calculator, which can be used to estimate whether or not your facility has enough supply to provide care to your patients. And we're also partnering with Lifebox to create new courses and content related to PPE. Um, one particular uh, resource I wanted to highlight, which can be downloaded with the QR code here, is a pocket reference card visual aid for managing patients with respiratory failure. Again, we'll be sharing the links to all of these with you. Finally, the WFSA will be launching a new version of the anesthesia tutorial of the week, which is more friendly to low bandwidth settings and also can now be browsed offline. As I wrap up here, uh, the last feature, uh, soon in the coming week, we'll be launching a new dashboard which allows you to track easily the current guidelines on therapeutics for COVID case management. And with that, I'll stop. Anna uh, and Assist International, thanks very much for the time. If there are any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me directly. Wonderful, thank you, Mike. Um, so those are really great uh, resources that complement a lot of the other webinars and discussions that you'll see. Um, very useful, easy to search, uh, opencriticalcare.org. Um, so unfortunately, I'm having technical difficulties and cannot share my screen. But on the Learning Resource Center, we do have a couple things that we want to share with the participants. What first is our disclaimer. And this disclaimer basically states that although we present information and we talk about uh, solutions that work for us in our settings, it's important that you use your clinical judgment and that you develop um, solutions that are appropriate for your setting and your resources. Um, also want to just point out that on the Learning Resource Center, we have several features that allow you to engage with your community. We have over 1,200 users on the Learning Resource Center. We have uh, discussion forums and community pages. So you can engage with people from all over the globe, from many different countries and many different resource settings so that we can find innovative solutions for all of the challenges that we all face. And then I also want to just um, pledge to the audience, the Learning Resource Center um, is uh, attempting to provide evidence-based peer review resources for our audience. And we will never um, accept money from advertisers or otherwise. Although we do reference um, or connect to other websites that may have advertisements on them, the LRC does not take any advertising 
um, money, and that's because we want to prevent any conflicts of interest from providing you the best information uh, and resources that we can. I also want to just uh, mention that the Learning Resource Center and specifically the Oxygen and Critical Care um, series is in a, a collaborative partnership that has been developed by the Learning Resource Center through Stanford University's Department of Anesthesia and Division of Global Health Equity through Assist International that you know very well. Um, and then we'll also have a collaborating sponsor, which is Project ECHO. Um, so most of the elements on the Learning Resource Center have references and resources attached to them. There are a lot of clickable features. So you can see as we go along through the question bank that um, when you click on the questions, you actually uh, get connected to the resource or reference that we use to answer these questions. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bala and Dr. Freddy, who are going to lead our panel discussion today. Thank you, Anya. And hi, everybody, to connect and assist to the, this session. Uh, we, uh, we're going to, to start the discussion. Uh, this, is a, this is a round table, so we are going to discuss so many basics of oxygen therapy, their indication, contraindication, definitions, and so sign, some signs and symptoms of these patients with hypoxemia and discuss so many cases, causes of, the, of this uh, situation. Uh, may I start with the first question for the panelists? Uh, which of the following are indications for oxygen therapy? So I'd like to point out that um, there is a poll question that has popped up that the audience can answer directly. Um, so you go ahead and put your answer in the poll. It's important that the panelists not answer because it will close the poll. Um, for the questions that don't have a poll that pops up, you can actually answer in your chat box. In addition, if you have other questions, you can put them in the chat box and the panelists will help to answer those as we go along. Ready to start discussion? Okay, let's go. Okay, which of the following are indication for oxygen therapy? Maybe, maybe the right question is A and B, hypoxemia and hypoxia. I would like to, Dr. Balaban, come in on some of, of the of the issues in this in this point, Dr. Balaban. Good morning. Uh, welcome. Dr. Bala, can you unmute? Unmute. Your microphone is off. Okay, while Dr. Bala resolves it, it's this issue, uh, Dr. Michael, uh, do you have the same, the right question, right answer is A and B? And why don't, don't you think in, in hypercarbia as indication of oxygen therapy? Dr. Balvin? Uh, am I audible, Freddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome. So, uh, so good evening to uh, and good morning to all the delegates and the panelists. So, the answers: which of the following are indications for oxygen therapy? And uh, you see the polling. So, 
if you I understand right, 9% have said hypoxemia, 16% voted for hypoxia, and C, hypercarbia, 1% has voted, and both A and B, 72% have voted. So we are happy with the 72% answer, and just wanted to clarify that for those who have voted for hypoxemia alone and hypoxia alone. So the difference between the two is something which all of us should be clear. Hypoxemia is decreased level of oxygen in the bloodstream, whereas hypoxia is decreased the supply of oxygen to the tissues. So you need to give oxygen both if there is decreased in the blood levels as well as the tissue oxygen supply. So the correct answer would be A and B. And wanted to clarify that hypercarbia is a situation where there is increased in carbon dioxide levels. You will enhance the clearance of the carbon dioxide by ventilation rather than oxygenation. So the answer A and B are the right answers. Okay. Uh, we must clarify that uh, most clinicians consider hypoxemia as a saturation post-oximetry value less than 94%. And uh, post-oximetry down of this level uh, corresponding to a partial pressure of O2 in blood less than 60 milli millimeters of mercury. Uh, that's it's an, an important uh, issue in, in this point. And it's it's important to to clarify that many patients may uh, enter in a state of ventilatory failure with hypercarbic, but this is not corresponding to an indication of oxygen therapy. Oxygen toxicity in the lungs is associated with mechanical ventilation uh, for respiratory failure in patients receiving fractional or of inspiring oxygen greater than 0.06 for prolonged durations. And this is another important uh, issue in, when you uh, are administering oxygen. But I would like to know the other comments of the panelists, uh, if uh, there are uh, many of the co amphitryons that may share the experience. Dr. Andrea? No, I think you covered it very well. Um, what hypoxia and the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia. I think it's very important, like you said, to point out that uh, the administration of oxygen will not uh, benefit hypercarbia. And so the most important thing in that instance is to provide ventilation for that patient. Um, and I appreciate you covering the, the definitions and um, lead, leading causes for oxygen toxicity. So I don't have much to add, excellent, excellent. <laughs> okay. Uh, Another important issue is uh, the possibility of retinopathy of prematurity that occur, occurs in premature infants. Okay, let's go to the next question. Which of the following are not clinical signs, symptoms of hypoxemia? Which of the following are not clinical signs or symptoms of hypoxemia?
Okay. Okay, Dr. Balaban. Yeah. Any comment about this question? I think um, uh, this is a very important question um, across the globe uh, where we don't have access to monitoring techniques, plus especially pulse oximeter. So it becomes clinically very important for the healthcare worker to identify respiratory failure or hypoxemia. So would we wait for the poll results or? So, so the, the excellent, so 90% of you have got it right. So loss of taste or smell is not what happens in hypoxia. Oxygen deprivation, uh, or what we call it as hypoxemia, results in stimulation of the respiratory centers in the central nervous system, which results in increase in the respiratory rate and the number of uh, exertions that they make to get enough tidal volume. And uh, because of decreased oxygen supply to the central nervous system, we have altered mental status sometimes that is present in hypoxemia. But the taste and smell are intact all the time. May I request one of our expert panelists and the intensivists here to comment on this particular aspect of the clinical symptoms. Dr. Michael. Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, as pointed out in, in COVID-19 patients, the loss of taste or smell has been a common finding ranging anywhere from a third of patients to, you know, the, the majority. Um, and the symptoms can last for several days. That is not a, a symptom that is specific to hypoxemia. Um, however, this is something that's been found in, um, with, associated with the virus and, and some other conditions as well, whereas tachypnea, dyspnea, sternal retractions, altered mental status are some of the many um, clinical indications that a patient might be hypoxemic. It's also worth noting that in some cases, patients may have varying degrees of these symptoms over a spectrum, which may or may not correlate well with the degree of the hypoxemia, and so patients may have uh, prominent features, prominent symptoms that are listed here, but relatively mild hypoxemia, or they may have very few symptoms and have uh, very significant hypoxemia. And that has been also something that's been um, shown not only with COVID-19, um, but with other forms of respiratory failure. Thanks, Dr. Michael. Any of the co-panelists uh, with any comment? Hi, this is Mark Singleton. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, although all of these signs and symptoms are uh, can be associated with hypoxemia or hypoxia, none of them are specific for that. And in fact, um, there may be many causes of tachypnea, dyspnea, sternal retractions, and other indications that a patient is, um, and also me altered mental status, may be related to other causes in patients who have perfectly normal oxygen levels. Um, so although these are good indicators um, without a pulse oximeter and some indication that the patient may be cyanotic, I think if you look at a patient and their lips are blue, you can, uh, in the absence of a pulse oximeter, you can have a pretty good, um, pretty good indication that perhaps this patient would benefit from oxygen. But uh, just one of these, or combination of these alone should make you think about high potential hypoxemia, but there could be other reasons for a patient to have mental status changes and uh, retraction. Certainly patients who um, have other reasons for having difficulty breathing and yet their oxygen exchange mechanisms could be okay. Thanks, doctor. Uh, to remember in pediatric patients, don't uh, be aware of nasal flaring, accessory muscle use, retractions, weakness or listlessness, liturgy, tachypnea, wheezing, and tracheal tag, and paleor and cyanosis. There is more important uh, signs or symptoms in pediatric patients. 
Okay, Anna. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the importance of the question is really to identify respiratory distress, whether it's from hypoxemia or otherwise, even if you don't have a pulse oximeter on the patient at the time. And so that when you see clinical signs and symptoms that can be associated with hypoxemia or respiratory distress, that you can obtain um, a pulse oximeter and also uh, to be safe, probably place the patient on oxygen until you can get a pulse oximeter. Um, but loss of taste and smell, as Dr. Lipnick pointed out astutely, is often associated with COVID-19, but not always associated with hypoxemia or hypoxia. True. Dr. Mars Singleton? Come on. I, I was just going to add um, th that my teachers who uh, trained me in a time of uh, or trained me from a time uh, before pulse oximetry, uh, relied greatly on the patient's color. And it's, a, it's something that we've sort of forgotten about a little bit. Uh, we tend to look at the pulse oximeter immediately, but um, you know, the, if you don't have that, the patient's color can tell you a great deal about their oxygen levels if they're cyanotic. Thank you, doctor. Any of the panelists? Are you going to comment? I mean, I, I would like to add that, you know, I know color is important, but uh, often we don't have the necessary lighting conditions to assess the color. Uh, it is important to go by, you know, in addition to the color, I would definitely stress on the need to pay attention to the clinical signs. I mean, clinical signs and symptoms never fail you. You know, the patient is breathing fast, you know, working hard on breathing. That child needs oxygen. Let's, you know, I, I definitely, you know, the, 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 the key here is to early identification of hypoxemia, early intervention. That's the key here. And without waiting for additional monitoring. I mean, good to have the monitoring if we have the facilities, but I wouldn't, you know, I, would, I wouldn't wait on other things. I will just jump on, you know, providing the necessary therapy, which is oxygen. Probably the mental status is a, is a, a sign of ominous uh, state in these patients. And we, and you doctor, have uh, uh, painting the, 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 the most, most important questions. Uh, uh, early diagnosis, early suspecting, early diagnosis and early intervention. This is the most important to show secure uh, success in, in this therapy. Um, we have to remember that normal saturation uh, in pulse oximetry is more than 94 patients in adults. Uh, it's quite, may, may be quite different in neonates that to, uh, is between, between upper 80s and, and early 90s. 90s. But uh, goal saturation when delivering supplemental oxygen uh, is to uh, maintain most patient goal saturation more than 90%. In pregnant patients, the, this, uh, this goal is a, li a little, little bit more uh, upper in 92%. And patients in shock that need uh, more, uh, that are in a, in an unstable physiological state need to uh, more uh, or upper levels of uh, goals in norm in saturation more than ninety four percent. Okay. Any of the panelists are gonna make another comment, Dr. Amol? Dr. Vanessa? I think uh, Dr. Freddy, Joe. probably the, the only thing is in COPD patients, uh, we may accept uh, a, a oxygen level of about 88. Uh, but apart from that, I think it should be over 90 in all the other cases. Yes, yes, Dr. Balaban. Uh, what if do we pass to the next question? <clears throat> oh. 
Okay. In which of the following situation should supplemental oxygen be started? Jean, can you launch the poll question? Sorry? Oh, okay. In which of the following situations should supplemental oxygen be started? Okay, Dr. Balaban. Yeah, can we see the poll result? Okay, so um, uh, that's pretty interesting. Like uh, in which of the following situations should supplemental oxygen be started? I think this is a, one of the most important uh, questions because we really need to know uh, when to start. So when oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter is less than 92%, it's definitely a clear indication to start. As all of you know, the 92% means it's only 92% of the hemoglobin that is present in the blood is saturated with oxygen. So definitely this is one indication. Number two is when you do an arterial blood gas analysis, if the partial pressure of oxygen in the PaO2 in the report is less than 60, you need to start oxygen. Then the third one, so the patient is in respiratory distress, like the symptoms which we saw, the previous question, patient is breathing uh, at a fast respiratory rate and his accessory muscles are acting so we know that we don't have a pulse oximeter, but we know that the patient is having add hunger or oxygen is deprived. So he, this patient needs oxygen. And number four is when the patient is in a state of shock. So when the patient is in a state of shock, the circulation is impaired to the tissues. So it becomes very pertinent that you give them oxygen to increase the dissolved oxygen in the blood and the tissues get oxygen. So all these four conditions are definite indicators to start oxygen. So 83% of you got right, but I think few of you have thought that it's just that saturation and few thought it's only the PaO2. But in this question, and the take home message is in all these four conditions, you need to supplement oxygen at the earliest. Over to Freddy. Freddy, we cannot hear you. Sorry, can you unmute? Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Evan. Thank you, Dr. Balaban. Dr. Evanessa, nice to. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Freddy. Um, I think uh, Dr. B was already pretty, um, pretty extensive. The, the one thing to add is that um, this question relates to um, previously healthy patients, I would say. Um, and so as discussed in the question before, when you have a patient that has COPD and the patient has an SpO2 of 90%, um, that patient does not necessarily need um, need oxygen, so you can wait. Uh, you can wait in a COPD patient um, a bit longer. So, as we said, um, you know we are targeting eighty eight percent in those patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chase Reynolds. Welcome. 
Uh, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> so Fred, Freddie, if I may add something. Um, I think, Please. thank you. So I think this question is really important because a lot of the questions that, um, that we get from participants is at what SPO2 is normal, at what SPO2 should we target, how long should we give oxygen, et cetera. And even in the discussion before, do we target 90, do we target 92, do we target 94? So I think that it's important to understand why you hear different numbers um, for SpO2 and starting supplemental oxygen. And, and part of the reason that the numbers are somewhat different is that one is how much oxygen do you need to deliver to get it into the blood, but also how much oxygen do the cells and tissues of the body demand? So when you have a patient who is pregnant, you have a patient who is in shock, you have a patient who has a high metabolic demand, you may actually need to give that patient additional oxygen. So, um, so the numbers may be, a, you may target higher numbers in patients with higher oxygen demand. Whereas a patient with COPD, we usually will target lower numbers as Dr. Mull point, pointed out um, because they are, used to having lower oxygen levels. And so they can, um, can tolerate a little bit lower. So usually for COPD patients, we target 88 or above. And for pregnant patients, patients in shock, patients with higher oxygen demands, we may say keep the SpO2 greater than 92 to 94. Um, and then Patients without those diagnoses, we would maybe even be happy with an SpO2 greater than 90%. So I think the importance of this question is, is the different patient populations have different needs of, for oxygen. It's so important that points you are commented, Anna. Um, it, I must have like the role of pulse oximetry in uh, diagnosis of hypoxemia and an indications to starting oxygen. And once you uh, starting uh, the oxygen, you have to titrate up or down according to the pulse oximetry lectures. Uh, this is important to, to, to remember that uh, oxygen therapy is uh, in high levels is not necessary when the situation is stabilized and pulse oximetry led us to titrating the oxygen uh, to the comfortable and cost-effective cost um, uh, dose for the patient. Dr. Andrea Morey, good morning and welcome to this session. Any comment? Good morning. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, in, in addition to what you just spoke about regarding titration according to the pulse ox seminar, I think we also have to consider um, reasons why the pulse ox seminar might be inaccurate. And so um, anytime you have patient movement, that could cause inaccuracies in your pulse ox seminar. So you really want to make sure that you have an accurate waveform when you're looking at your uh, pulse oximeter. Additionally, um, if the patient is hypotensive significantly, that may interfere with your pulse oximetry. Um, also, if the patient has any reason for vasoconstriction, that uh, can be a contributing factor. So whether they're cold or maybe they are on norepinephrine or some other vasopressor that's causing them to have a vasoconstriction that may interfere with your reading. Uh, often we see in the operating room the ambient light. If the light is shining directly onto the pulse oximeter, that could uh, interfere with the waveform. Um, so these are things just to keep in mind that when you're assessing, if you if you look at your life box or your pulse oximetry on your monitor and you don't have a good waveform, then I would assess the patient again. The most important um, sign is clinical signs. So looking at the patient's oral mucosa, looking at their nail beds, um, and then assessing your pulse oximeter in the moment, uh, seeing if there's any adjustments that are needed. Great, Dr. Andrea. 
thank you so much for your comments. Any of the panelists are going to comment more issues? If not, may we pass to the next? Freddie, I was just going to mention one brief thing, um, oh, just to add on to what, you, Dr. what Dr. Murray was saying in terms of uh, reasons why X pulse oximeters might not be um, accurate. Something that comes up, I think, frequently is um, has to do with the quality of the oximeter that's being used. It's very common that fingertip pulse oximeters are used um, in many settings. They're convenient, they're inexpensive, and most of the time they get the job done. However, um, many of those oximeters are work quite well um, and are very accurate, but but when it comes to sick patients, for all the reasons Dr. Murray said, they especially perform quite poorly. And so that's just something to consider um, in your well patients, inexpensive pulse oximeters, fingertip oximeters may work quite reliably, um, but in your critically ill patients, those oximeters may function sig to, to a significant degree uh, much worse. And so something to be aware of, thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, okay, pass to the next uh, discussion. Uh, how often should oxygen saturation be monitored? How do you titrate oxygen up? How do you titrate oxygen down? Uh, this is a very important uh, issue in oxygen therapy because oxygen is a drug. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Anna, may may you open the discussion in this point? Dr. Anna. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. Apologies. Um, so the question is, how often do should oxygen saturation be monitored? And how do you titrate oxygen up? And how do you titrate it down? Is this correct? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so it depends on the, the status of the patient. If the patient is very stable, oxygen saturation should be checked with all the vital signs. So a very sta stable patient on the ward, if their vital signs are checked every four hours, you can check that patient's SpO2 with vital signs. However, once a patient requires oxygen, um, is in a high dependency unit or ICU level care, then the patient should be placed on continuous SpO2 monitoring. That's assuming you have enough pulse oximeters to check this patient's SpO2 and the other patients that need SpO2 monitoring. So if you have a limited number of SpO2 monitors, then you want to probably check this patient's oxygen saturation as frequently as you are able. Um, how do you titrate oxygen up? Again, this depends on the goal SpO2 or target for each patient. And as we just discussed, those targets can be slightly different. For example, a COPD patient, I will target um, greater than 88. For a pregnant patient or a patient who's in septic shock, I will target something a bit higher, such as 92 or 94%. For a patient without very many comorbidities, I'll tolerate an SpO2 greater than 90%. And then how do you titrate oxygen down? I think this is a really important question because it's easy to put someone on oxygen and turn the flows very high because you're worried about the patient. But as we now know, there are complications associated with hyperoxia or too high oxygen delivery. So typically, most of us would say that the high limit of SpO2 that you should target would be around 96%. So that once your patient reaches 96% or above, you can titrate down the flows on oxygen supplementation. So those are the numbers that I use when I'm in the intensive care unit taking care of patients, or even when I'm in the operating theater taking care of patients under anesthesia. Okay, thank you, Anna. Dr. Balaban, any comment about this? Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was very well said, but uh, in low resource areas where uh, there are more number of patients and less equipment, I think uh, these are the areas of concern and uh, it is 
probably every 15 minutes uh, it could be monitored from if you if you need to share the pulse oximeter and in stable patients who are clinically uh, comfortable and uh, the respiratory rate has become better and you see the oxygen levels more and if there is a dearth then uh, you can even you can space it much more so uh, uh, based on the infrastructure the healthcare worker has to make sure that uh, monitoring is done um, periodically for all the patients who are on oxygen and uh, when the saturation crosses 96 and and when the resources of oxygen are less then it's better that they come down on the flows slightly titrated just to keep the oxygen level at 96 over to you Fred. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Balaban. It, it, another important thing is to consider a change of device of, uh, of from the, for delivery of oxygen. Dr. Mark S Singleton, uh, any comment about this? Not only- I, I, I think the <laughs> comments that have been made have been uh, very uh, relevant and um, I don't have a whole lot to add. I think that some of us on this panel aren't used to thinking of oxygen as a rare resource. And I know that in many parts of the world, it is a rare resource and one that um, you know, needs to be used with care uh, and, and um, good stewardship of uh, available oxygen uh, in a facility. Um, I think another thing that I always find interesting when thinking about oxygen is how fantastic it is that we've evolved as a species, as, as mammals, to live in an environment that, um, you know, we can deliver five times the amount that we usually breathe to our patients. And, uh, you know, it's just something we kind of take for granted that we're walking around breathing, uh, you know, 21% 20 of what we often give to patients in the hospital. And, you know, that margin of uh, our therapeutic ability, uh, I just find remarkable. And I, I, I don't think about it as often as I should. Thank you, doctor. Any of the panelists? Dr. Casongo? Okay. Any of the panelists have to say? Any comments well, about this? Dr. Freddy, you, um, you, you asked um, what about switching devices? I think that's uh -huh. a very, um, very good question as well. Yeah. So because it depends on a device how much oxygen you can deliver to the patient. So for nasal prongs, for example, the maximum um, of oxygen you can deliver is about 40%. But if your patient um, is still, still has a low oxygen saturation, you might want to switch to a non-rebreather mask, um, which will give you up to 95% of oxygen. So um, using different devices uh, can help you to either titrate up your oxygen or titrate down your oxygen. So if you have a patient who is, um, who is now has a good saturation on a non-rebreather um, mask with 15 liters, for example, you can titrate it down and um, you want to maybe switch to nasal prongs so that the patient, that you will not use up so much oxygen and you don't get into um, a problem of rebreathing your, um, your expired gases. Um, so, so your CO2, for example. So I think that's a very relevant question and can, um, can uh, save oxygen, a limited resource, and can also help your patient um, get off the oxygen um, faster. Or if you need to escalate the other way, of course. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vanessa, for clarifying this important issue in, in oxygen therapy. Okay, any comment of the co-panelists? 
I just want to remind all of the participants that if they have questions, uh, a lot of people are posting those in the chat box. And if you post a question, then we will try to either answer in the chat box or get the panelists engaged to answer your question. So one of the questions was about pulse oximetry in newborns. So I'm going to ask doctors uh, Mark Singleton and RJ Ramamurthy to address uh, the differences in managing pulse oximetry for newborn patients. RJ, you want to take that or should I? Just one okay, point to great. make is uh, that <clears throat> when a baby is born, um, the, their fetal hemoglobin is, um, you know, still circulating and they're uh, in the process of making a slow transition to adult hemoglobin levels. Uh, so, the fetal hemoglobin um, has a much greater affinity for oxygen. So it will become, because the baby's used to extracting oxygen from the placenta, from placental transfer. So uh, fetal hemoglobin is um, in that way, a, a more uh, vigorous uh, attractor of oxygen molecules than adult hemoglobin. Um, so you would expect to see a, um, uh, at a lower concentration of oxygen, a uh, higher uh, uh, oxygen saturation from that fetal hemoglobin. Um, babies uh, can do very well with uh, oxygen levels that are uh, perhaps a little bit lower than what we are used to seeing um, uh, because the oxygen that, uh, that they're holding onto with their hemoglobin is uh, significantly greater. Um, RJ, you want to add any other thoughts? I'm sure there are many that I think, <laughs> I'm Yeah, done. I think that's, that's very well said. So essentially, you know, there is a transition period within the first three months when the fetal hemoglobin kind of goes away and replaced by adult hemoglobin. So that's also important to remember when the transition occurs, when you're trying to decide on, you know, how, what are the implications of monitoring in this age group? Thank you, Mark, for putting those things really eloquently. Thank you, Doctor, for your great comments about neonates and oxygen therapy. Okay, uh, if no more comments, we pass to the next uh, issue. What factors can interfere with pulse oximetry readings? How can the pulse oximetry be adjusted to ensure accuracy? Doctor Balavent, any comment about this issue? Uh, I think uh, it's very pertinent uh, for those who join in um, taking care of the patient in the initial phase to know exactly how to plug in the pulse oximeter into the patient. And uh, suppose if, the, if, the, if they find the patient very chill and cold and clammy extremities, it becomes important to rub it, make the place warm before they put the probe because you need the pulsation in the, in the nail bed to make sure the pulse oximeter works. That's number one. Number two, it's to be put in such a way that uh, uh, the, when you see the pulse oximeter probe, the red light has to pass through the nail bed and it has to come out. So they need to adjust it. These are small, simple things that would make it very important. And they just have to see once that is done, they get a good waveform then they are, not, they, they are sure that the reading that they're getting is right. Over okay. to you, Freddie. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Ramamurthy, uh, what, what, uh, do, what do you think about the, the factors interfering with pulse oximetry readings? Uh, well, I think, uh, as Dr. Murray pointed out earlier, is the ambient light, which is a common factor that people often neglect that, you know, there's a too bright uh, ambient light that can, you know, impair the ability for the oxygen uh, probe to pick up. So, in addition to that, you know, pigmentations and, uh, you know, high pigment areas can kind of some, some, some part impair the ability for the signal to pick up. Uh, it's important to have the incident light and, uh, and, that, and the sensor are opposing each other. So often people kind of wrap it around without paying attention 
to the fact that the light is shining right onto the reflector. So that's a common error I find. It's often you see that you just have to unwrap it and make sure the light is kind of, you know, it's a, again, very simple thing that we often forget in the, when, when these are done in a, in a panic driven situation, like you want, to, you want to pay attention, all these simple things. Yeah, okay. I, I, I would just reinforce what uh, RJ just said that we're, and he's talking about the oximeter probe that is like a little Band-Aid. Uh, it, it wraps around the finger uh, or here sometimes. Um, and so there's positioning um, uh, variations that can occur with that wrapping. The kind that just clip on, they're, they're made so that the um, light emitting diode and the sensing diode are on opposite sides almost all the time. But the ones that are like a little uh, Band-Aid that have adhesive, you really do have to be, pay special attention that they oppose each other in an equal way on, on the finger or the extremity. So that's a really good point. I, I find that all the time that they've been applied without really carefully uh, looking at that. That's true. Again, that and is and Mike, probably pediatric specific because we do use yeah, those wrap around a lot in the pediatric. In adults, you probably just use a clip-on. So that's not the a big issue tricky. in adults. <laughs> The thing that's tricky about that is when it's not wrapped in uh, the way that we're describing, you can still see a waveform, but there may be a great variation in the oxygen saturation. So although the waveform might be there, the accuracy of the number is, uh, can be greatly affected. And so if, you're, if you think that you're seeing a patient that's got a 92% oxygen and you rewrap that thing, sometimes it comes up to 98 or 99. I see that frequently. Would you guys you, mind if, if, if I take us a step back? Because I think a lot of our participants may not be anesthesiologists. And in my experience, um, even some of the trainees and medical students and nursing students, and even sometimes bedside nurses, don't actually know how the pulse oximeter works. And so unless you understand what the pulse oximeter is, is doing, um, it's, it's more difficult to understand the limitations and accuracy of a pulse oximeter. So the pulse oximeter requires a pulse. Uh, that's its name, it's a pulse oximeter. So it's a pulse and then it uses the pulse to measure the amount of oxygen that is on hemoglobin. So if you have anything that interferes with its ability to detect a pulse, the patient doesn't have a pulse, the patient is very uh, vasoconstricted. So if you have vasoconstriction in your extremities, then that pulse will not be detected by the pulse oximeter and you will get inaccurate data. Um, and then just as Dr. Ramamurthy and Dr. Singleton were addressing, if, the, if it's not positioned correctly, then the pulse oximeter will be unable to detect the pulse. If the patient is hypothermic, oftentimes we will vasoconstrict in our fingers, our ears, our nose, wherever we have placed this pulse oximeter. So I think it's important to realize that there are limitations to the pulse oximeter that we must recognize, but I think more importantly is that pulse oximeters save lives. And so it's incredibly important to um, use the pulse oximeter. Um, but if the, if the number is inaccurate and you're doing the right thing, you know that you're delivering oxygen to that patient, then you might want to interrogate your device um, and make sure that it's positioned properly and that the patient's um, extremity has, has good uh, vascular flow. Thank you, Anna. Um, the next uh, discussion is about how long should oxygen be provided to a patient that is hypoxemic? How long should oxygen be provided to a patient that is hypoxemic? Dr. Balaban. Um, I think uh, I just uh, see Dr. Fadzai joining us. So maybe uh, <laughs> we'll ask Fadzai to take this. Oh, please. Dr. Fadzai? Dr. Fadzai? Oh, sorry, I thought I'd admitted myself. Um, thank you, Dr. Balavin, for that question. Um, 
I think the, the answer to this question is as long as the patient needs it. I think someone earlier on mentioned that oxygen is a drug. So we give it as long as the patient needs it. We've discussed at length about our goals in terms of saturation levels. So when you've reached the saturation level that you think your patient um, should have, and they're stable, you can then start considering titrate, titrating. So I'll just repeat again. I think we said we want saturations greater than 92 in general, but with certain patients like your COPD patients, you want a saturation. If you get greater than 88, you're usually happy. Um, if oxygen is a problem, you can then consider taking that patient off oxygen because you achieved your goals. Um, with your pregnant women, with your children, you want higher saturations, your 92s to 94s. So I think the correct answer is as long as your patient needs the oxygen, you give it until you've reached your goals. Hey, thank you, Dr. Fatsai. Dr. Elizabeth Ogbali. Yes, hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, I've been trying to talk all the while, but I've been muted, so it's not i've not been able to participate but i i quite okay. uh, share with the opinion of dr fazai that um, oxygen should be given be given as at when necessary but it is also important to know that the goals that the person who is giving the oxygen wants to achieve is it just to tie the patient over a difficult period or is it for maintenance to focus in for a prolonged oxygen um, therapy. So those that has to be set. The goals for the oxygen therapy has to be set right from the beginning. Uh, that is my okay. um, opinion about that question. This led us to, to pass to the other discussion. What are the different types of non-invasive oxygen therapies? How do they differ in terms of dosage and devices needed? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Dr. Elizabeth, uh, any comment about this? Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, what, what are the different types of non-invasive oxygen therapy? Different types of non-invasive oxygen therapy. Uh, what okay, are the advantages? Yeah. Yes, well, we can start from the simple uh, face mask um, to uh, uh, nasal prongs. Um, well, for the nasal prongs, this, this can be given on the ward. Uh, it's non-invasive, and uh, it's, but it depends on the patient's ventilatory parameters. That means the patient has to be making um, efforts on its own to be able to breathe, to benefit from using an, an, a nasal prongs or nasal catheter. The face mask is still okay, but the disadvantage is that for a conscious patient who wants to talk, to eat, and do other things, it may be a bit um, cumbersome. Um, there's another, the CPAP device, it's a, a non-invasive, um, uh, oxygen therapy method, but it has to have, you need to have a, a ventilator or something to drive it, to give the continuous uh, airway pressure for you to be able to use um, a CPAP device. So uh, I think for, um, if you're in the outstation or in the rural areas where you don't really have uh, much facilities, you can do with, um, Nasal prongs or face mask. Okay. To, to highlight on other devices are the nasopharyngeal catheters, simple masks, non rebreather masks, venturi valve uh, mask plus mask. Those of the, uh, the, those of the of the dog devices and included in adult and child therapies with oxygen. Especially the nasopharyngeal catheter is uh, used in infants and child. Okay. Uh, any comment of the of the panelists, Dr. Reynolds? I have no comments. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just, Let's go to. Sorry. I just wanted to Anna? highlight um, to the.
to the participants that it's important to familiarize themselves with the different devices and the different fraction of inspired oxygen you get from each device. Um, so depending on the flow rate you dial up of oxygen, you get a different uh, fraction of inspired oxygen. So if you think you're, you know, what we normally do is we start off with say your nasal prongs, which require less oxygen. And if I'm able to achieve my oxygen levels, then I'm happy to keep my patient on that. But in the event that the patient isn't doing well, you then want to keep titrating um, upwards with the other devices. I think um, Michael just shared a link in the chat that uh, will lead you to a table that gives you all the different devices, the fraction of inspired oxygen you get depending on the liters that you dial up. And it's important to familiarize yourself with those when you're administering oxygen to patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, pass to the next uh, question. One of the following is the correct order for least uh, inspired fraction O2 to highest uh, fra uh, inspired fraction delivered. Nasal prongs, okay, that, that's the options. Please mark as you think is the right. Okay, Dr. Balaban. Yeah, uh, can we see the results too? Oh, excellent. So almost 80% of them got it right. Uh, with nasal prongs, you can go up to a FIO2 of 0.4 with a simple mask maximum up to 0.6, better as a non rebreather because you the wire bag associated with that, you can scale up your uh, FIO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen delivered to as high as 90 to 95%. So that's the right answer. I think uh, probably we need to move okay. on into the discussion. Okay. Dr. Fatsai. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I did just touch on that. Um, so with, the, with your nasal prongs, you can usually dial up from about one liter to five liters, and that will give you an FIO2 of about 21 to 40%. Um, and then with your simple face mask, um, you're able to dial up to about 10 liters, six to 10 liters we usually dial up, and that gives you an FIO2 of about 45 to 60. And then like Dr. Balavenk had explained, with the non-rebreather, you have a reservoir bag that also delivers oxygen when the patient takes a breath. So you're then able to get much higher fractions of inspired oxygen. So that gives you up to as high as 95%. Um, in terms of fraction of inspired oxygen. Okay, any comment of the co-panelists? Okay, I think this is this is a very easy. Dr. Sorry, Perretti? Dr. Dr. Singleton, please. I, I was just going to add that uh, a good way to think about that, and I I think about it this way myself, is what we're trying to create is an environment around the patient's airway that is enriched oxygen. And the, pro the problem with that occurs during inspiration. So the pr patient takes a breath, they exceed the flow that we're delivering to them. Um, and then they, what the rest of their breath entrains other than that very initial uh, part that has that supplemented oxygen is room air. So with uh, nasal cannula, we're filling their nasal passages and their upper airway with oxygen, but the moment they start to take that breath, they are, uh, once, it, once that little uh, area in their nose and upper airway is exceeded, then they're breathing air. So uh, a simple mask does the same thing. Once they draw in that uh, oxygen enriched under the mask, they're pulling air from the side of the mask. And that's why the reservoir bag is so effective is it creates an extra reservoir of oxygen. So um, it, if you understand that, it's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, another way of um, delivering oxygen is to create a tent over the patient's head. Uh, and then you really increase the amount of space 
uh, that you can fill with enriched uh, oxygenated uh, air, if you will. So um, those can be effect very effective as well. Thank you, Dr. I Mark. For I, your... I, would, I would like to also add um, that for the audience, uh, Dr. Mike Lipnick shared a really great resource on the different oxygen delivery devices. So you know what, what flow to use, what flow in liters per minute of oxygen to use with each device, and what fraction of inspired oxygen these devices can deliver. Um, in addition, there are different oxygen delivery devices that are sometimes used in pediatric patients. I would, I would argue that the tent that Dr. Singleton just described is more commonly used in pediatric patients versus adults. Um, so I think it's important, um, if, actually, if you go onto the Learning Resource Center and you click on this question, it will actually take you to um, a list of the different oxygen delivery devices and which patients they're indicated, what flows to use with each device, and what FiO2 is delivered. And I think it's important because not only do you want to choose the appropriate device in order to meet the oxygen demands of the patient, but also you want to make sure that you do not waste oxygen. It's a precious resource, it's expensive, and oftentimes is in li limited availability. So if you choose a nasal cannula and you turn the flows up too high to 15 liters per minute, you're actually wasting oxygen. So if you're gonna, if your patient requires that 15 liters per minute, then you wanna use the mask with the reservoir bag that you can see in this picture here. So it's important to understand what flows are appropriate for which oxygen delivery device. And I think that I'll just also say that as Dr. Singleton pointed out, that um, the amount of, of flow in liters per minute that the patient breathes in and out um, is, is typically based on the size of the patient. And so when we talk about oxygen delivery devices, we often will break them up into two categories. One is low flow oxygen delivery and one is high flow oxygen delivery. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about high flow oxygen therapy or high flow nasal cannula, um, things that a lot of us have been uh, working with in the context of COVID. Um, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in another session, the session after next. So we'll get into the high flow oxygen therapy devices. Um, but just know that the low flow devices are gonna be nasal cannula, simple mask, uh, mask with a reservoir, and then also the Venturi valve devices. Um, so someone is asking in the um, chat box about nasal cannula. Uh, nasal cannula can be used in children or adults. It's usually anywhere from half a liter up to five to six liters per minute. In pediatric patients, we can use a nasopharyngeal catheter and that flow is very low. It's gonna be half liter to maybe up to two liters per minute. Um, and I'll defer to Dr. Singleton on the nasopharyngeal catheter, but it, the nasopharyngeal catheter is used in infants. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your great highlights. Okay, let's go to the next. Uh, let's go to the next question. Discussion uh, about it's about humidification. Humidification is a is a important thing, especially for for any uh, one type of uh, of devices. When humidification is needed for oxygen therapy, why is humidification needed? Why is is necessary humidification, Doctor? Dr. Vanessa. Uh, thank you, Dr. Freddy. Um, humidification is needed when you have higher flows. Uh, so if you have um, a, a nasal, nasal prong with a flow of two liters, it's not needed. But if you have any higher flows, um, it would be needed. And what exactly is humidification? So humidification means that you um, saturate the air with, um, with moisture and that will prevent your tracheal secretions or secretions in your airways and lungs from drying out. So if you have any, if you're breathing in high flow oxygen, it tends to dry out your secretions. So when you have a patient who, has, um, who is intubated, for example, 
and you don't humidify the air that you give to that patient, then the secretions will dry out and the patient will not be able to cough up the secretions. Instead, the secretions will be stuck in the bronchi, possibly plugging the bronchi or even in the um, endotracheal tubes. Um, and then you would have to exchange, eventually exchange the endotracheal tube. And um, it actually can cause a lot of harm to the patient when your endotracheal tube is blocked, patient can, patients can die from that if you don't get to them um, early enough in order to exchange the endotracheal tube. Um, and how do you now humidify uh, the air? So you have to, you have to basically um, have the oxygen flow through a water bottle. Um, and you use either sterile water or you have to boil the water before to make sure that um, it's, it's in a sterile uh, environment. And you have to make sure to exchange it um, on a frequent basis so that you don't, you don't harbor any uh, bacteria in, in that fluid. Um, but for nasal prongs, for example, or for you know, just a face mask, it's, uh, it's not necessary, but any, any high, higher flows, um, you would have to look to, um, to find some humidification. Okay, Dr. Michael, do you, do you have any comment about cylinders? Oh, no, I was just putting in the chat window a few uh, resources um, for humidification that Dr. Moll was referring to um, on the point of our prior question about concentration of oxygen delivered. Another um, common scenario is, you know, it depends on what the quality of your oxygen source is. It's common that oxygen concentrators will not be producing 100% fraction of inspired oxygen. Similarly, many cylinders are often not filled with 100% oxygen in different settings. That depends on the quality of the source. Um, there are many reasons why an oxygen supply, even, even a piped wall oxygen supply can be low uh, a lower uh, concentration of oxygen than 100% and that can impact the delivery to the patient. So just wanted to throw that out there as a commonly encountered reason why your, your delivered concentration of oxygen may be lower than what you, you estimate based on published tables. Okay, last issue, you drive us to the next. Can humidification bottles be reused? How do you set up humidification if there is no sterile water? Uh, any comment of the panelists, of the other panelists? Sorry if I don't have <laughs> any of you, please. Dr. Balaban, how do you use the humidification bottles? Uh, actually, uh, one of the most important thing is when you use uh, reusable humidification bottles, it's very important that uh, we have to make it sterile and uh, otherwise it will be a big source of infection, especially a respiratory infection. So the healthcare worker should know whether it's a disposable one or a reusable one. If it's disposable, it's easy. If it's reusable, you need to have sterilization protocols that you need to uh, completely clean it. There are several methods to sterilize the bottles, uh, which uh, uh, based upon the resources available, uh, so uh, they could use uh, uh, the um, uh, the bottle and infuse centers. I have seen in especially deep in rural areas, all that they do is uh, they autoclave it or they boil it in hot water and they make it uh, the bottles very sterile. So it's based upon uh, uh, the most important take home point is the sterility need to be maintained of these reusable bottles. Okay, thank you, Dr. Balvin. Dr. Elizabeth, yeah. any comment about this? This is a very common question. Sorry, Freddie. This is a I'm very sorry. common question, and we're already getting several people in the chat box who are asking about sterile water. And if you don't have sterile water, what can you do instead? So I think the, uh, Dr. Bala makes excellent points, um, but I would add that um, you know we need sterilization processes not only for the humidification bottles, but if we don't have sterile water, how would how would we how would we ensure that the water we use for the humidification bottles is clean? 
the importance of having sterile water or clean water in the humidification bottles is that this is, this is humidification a patient is breathing into their lungs. So it's very important that the water is uh, distilled or sterilized. And so a lot of people are asking these questions. This is a very, very frequently asked question. And so, you know, ideally the first step or the, 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 the preference would be to obtain sterile water, um, but there's, you can also use a distilled water. And how do you make distilled water? Anybody? I do agree that the, you have to change the water each 24 hours at least, mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, but do you just use water from the tap? Uh -huh. Or do you use some other type of water? Uh, Does anybody water remember the tap. In, in chemistry class or any, any other ways to make distilled water? <laughs> Distilled water is, is just evaporated water from, from boiling. So if you can boil um, the water and ke catch the evaporation, that is distilled water. Um, so it's important that the water be either sterile water that you get from medical supply or that you use a distilled water. So if you don't have the sterile water available but you need humidification, you must ensure that it has been boiled or distilled. That's a that's an easy way to make um, distilled water. Dr. Freddie, I believe you're muted again. Oh, sorry, Dr. Vanessa. Uh, what about the temperature of the water? Any recommendation about? Um, thank you, um, Dr. Freddy. Um, the, the, well, it's especially if you have uh, cold oxygen, it's especially um, uh, important to humidify um, the, the air. And it should, be, it should be, I would say, body temperature. So, uh, you know, the, you don't want to have it too cool because then you will cool the patient down if the patient inhales um, very cool air. So, um, you know, I believe it's about, you know, 35, 36 degrees, but please correct me, um, my other co-panelists. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, what about awake prone positioning? When should this be uh, tried or done? Dr. Balaban, uh, are you using problem positioning for your patients? Um, yes, actually um, the COVID pandemic has uh, brought into oak the advantage of using prone position, especially because of the ventilation perfusion mismatch that happens and uh, the gravity dependent, as all we know that uh, uh, the gravity dependent collection of the blood and aeration that happens uh, between the supine and in the prone position. So there are several articles which have been published on uh, in the COVID-19 patients with, uh, uh, with significant involvement of the lung. They've done extremely well in prone position. We have seen two types of one when the patient is on spontaneous and the other one is when they are ventilated. Uh, the, the basic concept of enhancement is because of the better ventilation perfusion mismatch uh, that you address to when you turn the patient to prone position. So repeated uh, prone and supine have been found to be extremely helpful, uh, in, especially in COVID situations. Okay, for, for the assistants that don't uh, manage these concepts, it's obvious that a patient in supine position uh, suffer a series of changes in their lung tissue and the prone or, or dependent areas, the bottom areas of the lung are compressed and atelectasia appears. Dr. Anna, any recommendation about prone, awake prone position? Yeah, and actually I'm gonna, I got a, 
another question from the chat box uh, about side effects of using high flow oxygen. How long do we use it? When should we intubate, et cetera? So, so one of the things about prone positioning is that when the patient is awake and on a non-invasive oxygen uh, supply um, or oxygen supplementation, you can encourage these patients to position themselves in prone position and it will improve their oxygenation. Um, contraindications to awake prone positioning are patients that are in extreme respiratory distress. If the patient has a very high respiratory rate, if they're using accessory muscles, if they look like they're going into respiratory failure, then you would not want to place them in prone position. You would probably want to consider um, whether they need additional ventilatory support, whether it's non-invasive or um, high flow um, or, or perhaps intubation and mechanical ventilation. But patients that are awake and slightly hypoxic who are able to position themselves, that's that you can try awake prone positioning at any time as long as there's not a contraindication. And just as a reminder for the audience, Dr. Lipnick is sharing some really wonderful resources in the chat box, but also these questions that you see on the screen are on the Learning Resource Center. And if you click on any one of these questions, it will take you to the references or resources that will give you protocols and, um, and guidance on how to, how to uh, initiate these interventions. Dr. Lipnick, any, any issue or thing do you have to highlight of this tool, academic tool, or any comment about prone position in awake patients? No, I think the Learning Resource Center has, has uh, outlined a lot of these resources very well, so I'd encourage everybody to go and, um, and, and download those protocols. I think our use of awake proning is evolving. Um, you know, in, in the COVID pandemic, this has been a... Uh, a wake up call for, for some of us with critically ill patients that we perhaps are under underutilizing um, this therapy in patients where there, where there may be some evidence, but in uh, conscious patients on oxygen therapy, the role of, of prone positioning, um, I think time will tell, uh, but it certainly is something that we are doing in our, in our facilities and um, you know, the exact uh, guidance around it, I think will, will evolve quite a bit in the coming months and years but uh, nothing specific to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, another question. When should oxygen therapy be escalated? If any of the co-panelists want to comment. Um. Dr. Fatsai? When should oxygen therapy be escalated? So I think you escalate um, oxygen therapy if one, you're not achieving your goals or two, you think the patient is deteriorating. So if your patient remains despite your interventions, you then want to increase and escalate your oxygen therapy. Um, I think we discussed earlier about the oxygen delivery devices. So if you're on a device that's providing a lower fraction of inspired oxygen, your patient saturations are not getting better or they remain unstable or they're deteriorating, then you want to escalate your oxygen therapy. I think that's my input. Thank you. Which devices has use high flow? Which devices use high flow oxygen? Dr. Balabin, any comment yeah. about this? So uh, the uh, once we have uh, not been able to achieve the uh, required oxygen levels, either in terms of pulse oximetry or with uh, the saturation of not going more than ninety, or if the PAO2 is not going more than 60, patient continuously having low oxygen levels. So it's a time to quickly initiate, uh, escalate the oxygen therapy. And one of the ways to do it is uh, to use a high flow oxygen, nasal oxygen therapy, where you increase uh, the, uh, this, it's up to 60 liters, you give oxygen per minute, and you try to increase the diffusion of oxygen against uh, in the lung to enter into the uh, blood circulation. And if, if uh, we fail in this, uh, we need to go in for a non-invasive 
uh, ventilation and the third thing will go in for intubation and mechanical ventilation. One of the biggest concerns in the COVID pandemic to initiate uh, uh, a mechanical ventilation with intubation has been uh, because the lungs become stiff and pneumothorax develops. So that's why um, uh, it is discouraged or it, it is kept as a last resort. And uh, um, most of the patients, uh, we try our best to wean them off uh, or get them better by using a high flow oxygen device before we end up in a Anna, any, any comments to close the session and take the, the last one of the uh, uh, questions? How long should it take for uh, pulse oximetry to improve? Or wh when should it take be intubated and placed on a mechanical ventilator to close the session, please? Yeah, so, so again, understanding how your pulse oximeter works um, is super important. And assuming there are no limitations to the accuracy of the pulse oximeter, you should see improvement in the SpO2 in, in less than a minute. So probably 30 seconds to a minute. There does tend to be a lag time. Um, but if you know that you are delivering oxygen to your patient, you need to keep doing what you're doing. Um, so because of that lag, sometimes people will, will change their intervention because the SpO2 remains low. <clears throat> but just know that it takes 30 to 45 seconds for the SpO2 uh, to improve. A patient should be intub intubated and placed on a mechanical ventilator when they are in respiratory failure. Respiratory failure essentially is an, an inability to oxygenate or ventilate. So an inability to get oxygen in or carbon dioxide out. So if the patient has um, respiratory failure, they will oftentimes be very tachypnic. They will oftentimes be using accessory muscles. They will oftentimes appear uh, like an obviously uh, distressed. So when a patient is, is failing the oxygen supplementation and failing the high flow nasal cannula or failing the non-invasive ventilators, then that's when we would consider um, intubating and placing on mechanical ventilation. Um, I, I just want to, first of all, thank all of our panelists and thank especially Dr. Freddie and Bala for an amazing lead on this discussion. Um, and thanks to all the panelists for showing up and, and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and your, your practice from multiple different settings across the globe. Um, and, and thanks to Dr. Mike Lipnick for sharing the wonderful resources on opencriticalcare.org. Um, I want to encourage everyone again to find the recorded sessions both on the Learning Resource Center and also on the Assist International website. And just to um, let all of the participants know that we realize we didn't answer all of your questions today because there are so many great questions, but we have um, this webinar is running through July of 2021. So upcoming, we will talk about critical care, both inside and outside of an intensive care unit. That's the next session. We will address eventually high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. We will address pediatric patients. We will address obstetric patients. So we have a lot of really great sessions coming up. So we hope you'll join us again. In the meantime, feel free to message um, each other and the panelists on the WhatsApp thread. And then you can also use the community pages and discussion forums on the Learning Resource Center. So I encourage you to share questions uh, with each other there as well. And just thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to Assist International and Project ECHO for support. And yeah, that was a great session. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Thanks, you. Anand. Thanks, Freddy. Thank you so Have much. Have a good day. Thank you, Thanks Dr. Mull and Dr. Elizabeth and Dr. Fadzai and all Thank our you, other Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, good. See you next time.